so this uh, will Let us uh, proceed with our program. So first uh, and foremost, let us uh, welcome our guest. First of all, uh, Miss Anamika um, and Banasri Bharadwas, I request uh, them to proceed with the welcoming program. So first of all, we'd like to welcome Dr. Ankur Barua um, with an our own line. So I request um, Mrs. Banasri Bharadwas and Ms. Anamika to welcome our resource person with an our own line. Thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Ms. Anamika to welcome Dr. Sanghamitra Choudhury, uh, head of the Department of Political Science, Bodolan University. Uh, she is the person who helped us to uh, connect uh, with our resource person. So thank you, madam, for your kind cooperation and active help. Now, I request um, Mrs. Banasri Bharadwas to welcome Dr. Banavina Brahma, our Honorable Principal Madam, uh, with an iron knife. Thank you, madam. Now, I would like to request our Honorable Principal Madam to deliver her welcome address. Please, Madam. Our invited guest, speaker, Dr. Ankur Borua, sir, uh, HOD Political Science Department, Portland University. Dr. Sangamitra uh, Chaudhary, Madam, my dear colleagues and my dear students. Today we are we are lucky enough to have Dr. Ankur Burwa amongst us. Who, Dr. Ankur Burwa is a faculty of the University of Cambridge. Um, actually, we have a different kind of uh, relationship bonding also. Yes, uh, I didn't know him till yesterday until Sankamitra introduced him to me, but uh, his mother uh, had been my professor in Cotton College days. His mother was a uh, uh, teacher at Logic and Philosophy Department in Cotton College, long time back. He has been a brilliant student throughout his uh, career, and we are lucky enough to have him amazed us today. And uh, we, he will be delivering um, two lectures actually, one the first half for the students and second half for the faculties. So here, uh, on behalf of the Kokoda College Fraternity, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Ankur Burwa to the uh, Kokoda Government College. Uh, we are very much grateful to you, despite your uh, busy schedule you have given us this time and um, I'm very much thankful to Sangamita Choudhury also because uh, she is the link uh, to Dr. Borua. She is the person who has introduced us to Dr. Uh, Borua. So we are very much thankful to you, madam. And uh, my, I believe that uh, our student will benefit from this kind of uh, lecture because this is the first time someone from Cambridge has come to our, uh, you know, uh, our college and uh, our student will get the exposure of um, Cambridge University like what it is and uh, not only Cambridge, you know, not only Cambridge but to other universities also. So Dr. Borua will be speaking about all these things and careers prospect also. So uh, feel free to ask any question you have in your mind to Dr. Borua. Okay. Once again, I welcome both of you to our college fraternity. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam, for your brief welcome address. Now let's proceed with the next uh, agenda, that is introduction of our honourable resource person. So uh, I'd like to request uh, Mrs. Bonosu Bharadwaj uh, to uh, read out a brief uh, information about Dr. Barua, and uh, this will make our students familiar with her. Please. Thank you, Pastor Seth. Honorable Resource Person, Professor Angkor Borwa, Professor Sankar Mitra Sodhari, Madam, Principal, Dr. Bonovena Brahmo, Madam, and uh, August Kadaring. Today, I would like to present before you a brief bio note about Dr. Angkor Borwa, University Senior Lecturer in Hindu Studies, Faculty of Divinity, University of Cambridge. <coughs> After a B.Sc. in Physics from St. Stephen's College, Delhi, Ongo read Theology and Religious Studies at the Faculty of Divinity, Cambridge. His primary research interests are Vedantic Hindu philosophical theology and Indo-Islamic styles of sociality. He researches the conceptual constellations and the social structures of the Hindu traditions, both in pre-modern contexts in South Asia and in colonial milieus where multiple ideas of Hindu identity were configured along transnational circuits between India, Britain, France, Germany, and USA. He studies how these ideas continue to shape the subjectivities of British Hindus across multi-ethnic environments and of the wider British public. To this end, he tries to introduce on his personal YouTube channel Hindu philosophical and theological ideas without employing any technical jargon. Dear students, you may visit his YouTube channel. Uh, the address is https://www.youtube.com/c/onkurborwa-divinity/videos. You can search and log in to his channel. The following are the three big questions which motivate his lines of academic inquiry. Here for better or worse, he does write with technical jargon. Number one, how do Vedantic Hindu theological universes enact the dialectic of particularity and universality? Number two, is there a scientific way to establish that you are a reincarnated spiritual cell that is Ziva or Atman? Number three, what would be the shape of a Hindu worldview which energizes moods of social egalitarianism? An integral dimension of Professor Angkur Borwa's academic research is the comparative philosophy of religion. He studies the theological and the socio-political aspects of Hindu-Christian engagements. In recent years, his research focus has moved to Indo-Islamic theology and in particular to an exploration of the dynamic intersections as well as the contested negotiations between the idioms of Bhakti, Zuko, Tahit, and Tasov on the multi-stratified post-colonial landscape of South Asia. Here I'm going to mention about some of his key publications. The books, Divine, The Divine Body in History, a comparative study of time and embodiment in the theologies of St. Augustine and Ramanuja. Number two, Debating Conversion in Hinduism and Christianity, published by London Rutledge in 2015. Number three, the Vedantic Relationality of Rabindranath Tagore, Harmonizing the One and its Many. Then, number four, the Brahma Somas and its Vaishnava Milieus, Intersections of Hindu Knowledge and Love in 19th Century Bengal. Fifth, his fifth book is The Hindu Self and its Muslim Neighbors, Contested Borderlines on Bengali Landscapes. Other publications and book chapters are his recent publication in 2021 is Competing Philosophies and Theologies of the Human Person in Sad Bauman and Michel Foss Roberts, The Mystery of God and Claim of Reason, Comparative Patterns in Hindu Christian Theodicy, 
published by International Journal of Hindi Studies. In 2020, with Hina Khalid, the feminization of love and indwelling of God, theological investigations across Indic context, published in religions, Vedantic approaches to religious diversity, grounding the many divinities in the unity of Brahman in Ayan Mahara's edited book, the Bloomsbury Research Handbook of Vedanta. The agnostic poetics of Dasha Fago, the soteriological confrontation between deity and devotee, published in Journal of Dharma Studies. In 2019, he published, revisiting the Gandhi Ambedkar debates of our caste, the multiple resonance of Varna, published in Journal of Human Hallows. The science of the self, Atmobita, the reconfigurations of Vedantic gnosis in Hindu modernities, published in South Asian history and culture. In 2017, some of his Key publications are The Absolute of a Data and Spirit of Hegel, situating Vedanta on the horizons of British uh, idealisms, published in Journal of Indian Council of Philosophical Research. So, here are so many publications. In fact, an uh, international figure, today we are lucky to have him amongst us. So, thank you, sir for your maiden visit to Kukrajar Forest. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Balasri, for a nice introduction. And now let's move to the main agenda. So I would like to invite Dr. Ankur Borua to take the chairs. And um, I hope all the students uh, will uh, listen uh, to the lecture attentively and will interact after the end of the lecture. Dr. Borua, please. Hello everyone, um, let me begin by saying I'm very happy to be here, um, partly because I get to see Kokrajar. Uh, I happen to be a person who doesn't travel too much, so when people invite me to go and give lectures in a place, I also get the opportunity to see the place. Uh, this in fact is not the first time I'm in Kokrajar. The first time was when I was about five years old, my grandfather was a uh, police inspector here, but I don't re remember much of Kokrajar in 1978, 1981, it's a very different place now. So uh, that's one reason why I'm happy to be here. The other reason is because I get to talk to you and I get to discuss some ideas with you. Um, I'm not really going to give you a lecture. In fact, as I told somebody last week, I don't like giving public lectures because I, I don't like giving lectures to people unless I know who they are. So I don't know who you are, what you're studying, why you're studying, there's no point of contact. So I'm not going to lecture you. What I'm going to do, I'm going to share with you some of my reflections on the art, the skill of writing, thinking, rethinking, rewriting. And I will only speak for about 20 minutes or 15 to 20 minutes. And thereafter, it is really up to you. You can ask me any questions you have relating to what I say, relating to career prospects, relating to possible academic trajectories, relating to what you may study, what you may not. So that's why I think uh, the title of my talk possibly uses the word participatory, that, that uh, I'd like you to participate in what I'm saying. Now, um, I have been involved in the process of writing, reading, rewriting, supervising academic prose for about 25 years to 28 years. And what I mean by academic prose is the kind of English we use in writing academic articles. And what are academic articles when you read books, when you read uh, different journal articles, you may have noticed that they're written in a certain style, they're written in a certain format. So the way in which I will speak to you if I am having lunch with you or having coffee with you, is not the way I will write an article. There's a certain structure, there's a certain format, there's a certain template, and that is simply what I mean by academic English. And as I said, I've been doing this for about 25 years, 28 years. The reason why I'm highlighting this point is because only in the last five years, in fact, during COVID, when I had a lot of extra time to think, a lot of things, I realized that I do have certain points that I would like to share pretty much with anyone who would like to learn how to write academic English. And what I'm going to show you today on some of these slides are some of my reflections on the skill, on the art of writing in an academic way, writing the kind of English that you actually read in your books, in your articles. So, writing. Academic English is painful, it's very tough, it's very difficult. 
but at the same time, it can bring you a lot of joy. And it can bring you a lot of joy if you reflect on what I'm going to say to you now about this slide. So when you see this slide, uh, can I invite some of you to tell me what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you see this slide? So that slide, where you see all these different patterns which are dynamically related and interrelated and interconnected, what do you see? Do not think, just tell me what you see. Do not think, do not overthink. Just one word, one phrase will do. Anyone? No? Okay, so let me answer. Oh yes, I see one hand go out. The top view of a dome-shaped structure. Yes, so that is the correct answer from an architectural point of view. But that's not what I wanted you to say. What I wanted you to say is, you see structure, pattern, harmony, order. You find system, right? So look at this. There are so many different parts which are all interrelated and related to one central axis that is going through it. Right? So when you write something, whether it's 5,000 words, 2,000 words, 10,000 words, 25,000 words, 80,000 words, which is the standard length of a PhD dissertation, everything you say, every section, every subsection, every chapter, every part have, has to be completely related dynamically interrelated with that central spine, with that central theme. So, I don't have a book with me right now, but if you hold up a book, you will see the book has a spine, right? The reason why the different pieces, different pages on a book don't fly apart is because there is one spine which holds together all the pages. So likewise, whenever you write something, there is the central axis. And the reason why the different arguments, different sentences in what you have written are not flying apart in a hundred different directions is because there is this stabilizing coherence. What is that one thing that you are saying? So, what, how do I find out what is that one thing that you are saying? Now here's the paradox, that often, it is only after you have been writing something for about three, four years that you realize what you were saying in the first place. So, as it so happens, as I'm speaking to you, I have also been um, involved in any series of email exchanges with one of my PhD students who is submitting very soon, maybe tomorrow or the day after. And I have been supervising her for about four years now, and only now, after studying a certain topic, uh, a certain aspect of Buddhism, we realize, she realizes, I realize, that we know what the topic is. Right? So the point is not that you wake up one morning and say, okay, this is the argument, I'm going to work on this topic, and here is the spine, and here is the answer. Often it is only through this very long, painstaking process this journey, think of it as a journey, as an ongoing journey of trying to understand what you were saying, you realize this is what it was about. And one way to look at it is in terms of this paradox that you're the, in the end lies your beginning, right? We, we think that, okay, here's the beginning on Sunday and here's the end on Saturday. Often it is only on Saturday that you realize what the whole week was about, right? So likewise, the process of writing, rewriting, thinking and rethinking, it is only along the way you begin to realize why I am on this journey. And here I was talking about my PhD student, and all my PhD students have this problem. They say, I don't know what I'm arguing. What is the big issue? What's the big question? And I always tell them, don't worry about the big question, big theme. Just allow it to develop organically from the grassroots. And the reason why I say this is because I see this happening to me all the time. When you write uh, academic prose, there is a process called double-blinded peer review. And what that means is that when you send this article to a journal or to an editing or a publishing house, uh, these, uh, these articles are anonymized. So they will not know who you are, they will not know your identity, and you will not know the identity of the people who are reviewing the article. So it's double blinded at both ends. And often it happens to me that my peer reviewers write reports like this saying, okay, here is a good article, and here is the main argument in chapter 2, and the main argument has not been sufficiently highlighted. And when I read this peer review report, I realize, okay, I never thought about that. I never thought that this was my main argument. But now it seems, yes, very meaningful. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that here I am, I have been researching a certain topic for about five years, making notes on that topic for about three years. I've spent about one and a half years writing the book, and even then, after eight years of this labor, I still don't know what the topic was about, right? So, the point is not that you have to get lost in finding the argument. Often the argument appears, grows, generates out of a huge amount of reading that you may have to do. A lot of 
reading and rewriting. But that is the spine I'm talking about, right? That is that principle of unity that runs through all the different things that you're going to say in 25,000 words, 80,000 words. Or, if you want an alternative metaphor, think of a tapestry where there's one, let's say, one golden thread which runs through the entire pattern in a zigzag fashion, right? If you were to remove that one golden thread, the entire tapestry will unravel, it will fall apart. What is holding together the whole tapestry is that one thread. So again, I ask you, what is that one thread? And if you say, I don't know the one, I don't know what that one thread is, you should not feel paralyzed, you should not feel okay, therefore I cannot write. You just have to start from where you are, from your notes, and keep writing from the ground zero upwards. And as you go higher and higher up, you begin to see, okay, here is a pattern that is emerging. So, just to add some more content to this image, this is what I try to do. And when I say I try to do, I say I try to do this because I have not yet got there. And I don't think I will ever get there. But this is what I try to do. I try to be, at the same time, a mouse and an eagle. Right? Now, what is the point of that metaphor? I try to be, at the same time, an eagle and a mouse. So, I am a mouse because I am at the grassroots, at ground zero, reading another article, another book, another paper, another essay. It's a very painstaking labor. It takes me weeks, months, years. 25, 28 years, I've been doing nothing but reading books. Right? So I'm a mouse at this, at this level. But if you're just a mouse, if you do not have the big picture, if you cannot see from 20,000 feet or 15,000 feet like an eagle, then you don't have an argument. And let's say somehow you can become at the same time a mouse and an eagle, and you can even combine the two words, mouse and eagle, and call it a meagle. So let's say there is a kind of being called a meagle. It doesn't exist, but it's a, it's a hypothetical, fictitious animal called a meagle. And you can become a meagle who is simultaneous. And that's the important point. At the same time, it's not that on Sunday you are an eagle, and on Tuesday you are a mouse. Every time you write, at the same time, you have to write as a meagle who is able to see what is happening at the ground, at the grassroots, and has this vision from 20,000 feet, 10,000 feet. And as you can see, this is why I said I tried to. I have certainly not become a meagle. It's very, very difficult, possibly even impossible, right? Because you have to have this panoptic view, this synoptic view of what is happening across the landscape, and yet be able to zoom into one particular detail of the picture. And that is actually what an eagle can do. When you look at an eagle, the eagle is flying at I don't know how many feet, maybe 500 feet, but from 500 feet, from that altitude, an eagle is able to spot a tiny mouse hiding in the grass, right? And in fact, it is precisely because the eagle has the sense of altitude that the eagle has the sense of depth, right? So combine the sense of altitude and the sense of depth is the great skill, the great task of writing where you will be able to find out what that exists. is. Now, this is, as you can see, just a schematic outline, just, just a vision what you are writing at the end of the day should have content, should be factually correct, should engage with the scholarly details and scholarship and all of that. But the reason why I show you this is because I believe that at the end of the day, whatever you write should be above all beautiful. There should be some beauty and you should feel after you have spent one week, one month, three years writing something, 25,000 words, 50,000 words, 80,000 words, Yes, today I have created a little bit of beauty, that's it, right? Because at the end of the day, if you think about it, academia, scholarship is a very solitary, even lonely enterprise. I mean, you are researching a topic on which, ideally, there should be only three other human beings in the world. I mean, even that's too many. I mean, ideally, there should be just you, right? Because, because otherwise, you are not doing a PhD. Because if you are researching a topic which the whole world knows, then as your supervisor will tell you, no, it's just under, not under, but over explored over research. So, as a result of that, what happens is that when you read people's thesis, dissertations, they are usually, I can guarantee you, it's very boring work. Because it's not exciting, because it's like extremely specialized work. Yeah, say, for example, when I uh, write my research papers, I'm in the faculty of divinity, which is basically the study of religion. I don't like write books on religion. I don't even write books on Hinduism. I don't even write books on a particular Hindu figure. I write books on a particular verse, in a particular text, written by a particular thinker in a particular century. That's how specialized it becomes. Right? And at the end of the day, we are all doing this. We are all in this business of producing extremely hyper-specialized work. So what, what's the point of it? If you ask me, my view would 
ultimately paid us. Because before we get there, yes, I mean, we write partly to get a job because employment is very important. We write to stay in employment. We write because it boosts our CV. There are all these material, real world constraints to keep in mind. I'm not saying that you should not worry about those things. But when you have done all of these, when you have ticked all those boxes, and on Friday evening or Saturday morning, you're having a cup of tea and reflecting to yourself, what is the whole point about? I mean, why do I do this? If you ask me, and, I, and I'm saying this to you because I know meet many students who somehow sometimes feel that they have lost their way through, through academia. They're like, for them, it's just like a, another business. It's just like another chore, another one more thing to do, another thing to do. So this is what I'm giving you here. It's not an answer to the difficult question how to write, but I'm giving you a vision that if you aim at producing a work of art, which is deeply interrelated in that manner, all the different sections, subsections, arguments, themes, they hang together. The sense of symmetry, the sense of consistency. That I have been able to say one thing, and only one thing, in 80,000 words. Right? I have written 80,000 words, but how many things have I said? Not two, not three million. I have said one thing 80,000 times. And then you see the axis, the golden thread, that, that, that pivot, which goes together the entire work. Now, all of this, as you can see, is quite schematic. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to break down this picture into some more concrete detail. And let's see if this works, yes. So, here I'm going to show you three slides um, where I, as I said in the beginning, I'm going to share with you some of my reflections on this art of writing, rewriting. Now, when I was 15 years old, 18 years old, nobody came up to me and said, okay, this is how to write. This is the fruit of my thinking on how I think. Right? So it's a kind of a meta level of thinking. It's not just thinking, but I've tried to figure out how I think, not just by thinking myself, but also by thinking through the work that students give me. So let's say I have three, I just wait. And let's say I have three or four PhD students who work on very different topics, which are not related in any way. And if I told you these four students are my PhD students, you won't even believe me. Because one of them works on A, another works on X, another works on B, another works on D. But when I read the work of each of these four individuals, I see certain common patterns, common problems, common themes, common difficulties, common anxieties, common worries that they struggle with. And when I see that happening, it reminds me of some of my own words, own anxieties, own problems. So what I'm going to show you now in the next two slides is not the answer to the question how to write, but again, a kind of an overview at say 10,000 feet or 20,000 feet that of what, of um, let's say some, some boxes you would like to tick. You can almost think of this as a mechanical algorithm. Like if you do A, you get B. If you do B, you get C. Okay. So, this is what I would say any beautiful piece of writing should look like from 20,000 feet. Whether you're writing on uh, Boro literary history, or whether you're writing on Indo-Christian engagements in South India, or whether you're writing on Buddhists in Australia, whatever may be the matter, this should be the form. Right? So what I mean by form and matter is that if, if I look at this object in front of me, it is made of steel or iron, that's the matter. But it has a certain form. It is not a square object, it is not rectangular. So in any, uh, in any form of beauty, form and matter, they go here, they come together in a certain way, a certain pattern. So likewise here, you don't see matter, of course, I'm not discussing any content, but this sh should be the form in my estimate. And here are the three elements of the form. I have even put some alliteration there, S, 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 right? There are three S's you should pick. So one is syntax, then is sense, and the structure. Now, in dividing these three elements in this way, I don't mean to say that this division is chronological. You don't start on Monday with syntax and move on to sense on Wednesday and end up on Saturday with structure. All of that should be deeply interrelated, but conceptually they are distinct. So let me start with our simplest one, syntax, which is just grammar. Right? Anything you write, anything you say, whether in English or Assamese or Bengali or Hindi or Boro or Spanish or Latin or Sanskrit, should have syntax. That is the baseline requirement. Because if there is no syntax, there is no meaning. It's as simple as that. Right? You can have the most profound idea in your mind, you can have amazing thoughts in your mind, but unless those thoughts are coherently expressed, it's not a thought. And I say this because often I find students, people, relatives, all kinds of people who say this to me. They say, you know, I really have
have the argument in my mind, but when I try to write it, it's not a good argument. Now, I all think judges, and I always say this, actually that means you don't have an argument. It cannot be the case that somewhere in your mind there is an argument, but when the argument falls down on a piece of paper, it becomes corrupted. If there is an argument, it has to be an argument all the way. There is no special language of thought which is somehow higher than the language of writing. The language of thinking and the language of writing is one and the same language. So if you are not able to express yourself in grammatically correct English or Bono or Bengali or Sanskrit or Latin or whatever is the language, you simply do not have a thought, right? So, so you can say this is the most baseline requirement. But the reason why I say it is baseline, because simply producing grammatically correct sentences does not make you a scholar, does it? I mean, if it were as easy as that, all of us would just become scholars by speaking grammatically correct Urdu or Persian or Arabic or Sanskrit or Latin or whatever. Now comes the next point, sense. And sense is how your different thought units, different units of thought are coherently laid out, arranged, formulated, connected, and interconnected. And in English, for example, because I'm speaking English, let's carry on with the language of English, we have connectors or logical connectors like however, since, therefore, because. Now you have to be sure that when you say however, it really is however and not since. When you say therefore, it really is therefore and not however. Often when I read uh, work of people who send their work to me, and often when I read my own work from five years ago or three years ago, I realize that actually what I meant out there, out there in my mind was a however, became a therefore when I wrote it up. And it may so happen that sentence number four in a certain paragraph looks like a however, but it actually it's a therefore. Right? So this logical connectivity, the connection of thought, should be worked out carefully, patiently. And again, this is why academic writing is so painful in one sense, right? To be able to sit down and work it out almost like a jigsaw puzzle. All the different bits, all the different moving parts have to fit together and come together in this pattern. Now, that leaves us with the final point, which is structure. And in one sense, structure is something, to go back to what I was saying, will develop organically. Structure is about how the different arguments are put together in different units. So when you read articles, 10,000 words usually, 8,000 words, you will see that there is an introduction, then there are two main, three main sections, then there is a certain problem that person is trying to persuade you to agree with or disagree with, and there's a certain route that is taken to the conclusion, and there is possibly a summing up. And so that's what I mean by structure. So structure, sense, and syntax, if they somehow come together, and build up this picture, then to go back to what I was saying, possibly you will have the satisfaction that even if you did not get high marks, even if nothing grand happened to you in your life, let's, let's hope all of that happened, you at least made something beautiful. Right? So that is what I'm going to get at. And this uh, is, I think here, the print is quite fine, so I won't go through all the details. This is just an attempt to put some more content in the previous one. So here I say, as you walk through the sentences, First, check for syntax grammar. Is the sentence one grammatically correct or not? And you can see here with the crime, the point I'm trying to emphasize is the small is beautiful. If I tell you that you have to write the PhD thesis someday in 80,000 words, I'm pretty sure all of you here will be scared. How on earth am I going to write 80,000 words? But people do it all the time. And how is it that people write 80,000 words? Because they don't start with 80,000 words. They start with one sentence. The start with one sentence, make sure it is grammatically correct, try to connect it to the next sentence, and repeat this process in an iterative manner. And think of it this way, because small is beautiful, if you're able to produce 50 sentences, or five sentences, which are beautiful in that way, you can simply multiply five or 50 by 100, 1,000. That is how you generate content. But every unit should have this uh, template. So here I simply say, you check for grammar, check for syntax, then you check for sense, and if you repeat this process throughout the whole article, then ideally you should have what I showed you on the previous slide. And here, because the print is very small, you, you can't see this, but I will read out what it says in the very last box. It says, meanwhile, don't forget that life is larger than logic. I mean, you know, I mean don't forget that one still has to do one's own business of living life, and not get absorbed into this process of writing. But provided you keep in mind that life is larger than logic, it does not mean life is lesser than logic. Right. So this is the structure that I'm presenting to you, and I think 
That is the last slide that I will show you before I invite you for any question that you may have. And again, this, this is a slightly more prosaic way to spell out the content of the previous slide. Uh, this is the standard one page that I give to anybody who works with me. That every time you write something, you must make sure you tick all these four boxes. So the first one, it says typo zero. There should be no typos. And typos, I mean typographical errors, like basic spelling mistakes, basic words which are repeated. And some typos are very simple, very straightforward. So if I say I write the word da two times, da, da, well, okay, I, I get it, that's a mistake. But sometimes, typos can crucially change the main argument. And when I read certain kinds of prose, it's not clear to me whether that was a basic typo you made or whether you really think it is so. Right? So if I am being charitable to you and say, okay, that must be a typo. No way this person could have made this mistake. But not everybody who is that charitable to you. Right? So a single typo, which may look like to you, oh, that's just a minor matter. But remember what I told you about the eagle. The mouse was an eagle. There is no error which is too small. Right? The moment you say that, you know, Okay, I'm an academic, I don't worry about the small things, I look only at the big pictures. You're not being a beagle. Every minute detail counts. If it is a semicolon, there's a reason why it's a semicolon. So that's what I mean by typos. Then holistic narrative. Now this is very important, I think. Which, what I mean by that, is that you have to write, develop a piece of work, a piece of writing, again, whatever is the, what is it, 10,000, 80,000, which is holistic. And by holistic, I mean it hangs together. All the different powers are not flying apart. So, you know, I mean, in the first part of an article, we make claims like, as I will see, or sorry, as I will argue, I will do this, I will do that. Now, you're making promises. Now, if I'm your reader, I'm hearing lots of promises on page one, page two. But let's say you do not redeem your promises, you don't fulfill your promises. I will feel at the end of page ten, what was that thing about? And so much was promised, and nothing was fulfilled. And often it happens to me as well, because again, you know, I mean, sometimes our thought processes are often very deeply, uh, you know, uh, subliminal. We are often not consciously aware of what we are saying. I make very subtle promises sometimes on page two, as we will see, as I will argue, and my peer reviewer report comes back and says, well, this was promised on page two, but was not fulfilled on page eight. So you have to make sure that what you say on page two corresponds to what you're going to conclude on page 18, and the other way around. Like, if you do say on page 18, as we have seen, you better go back to page 3 and see if you have actually said it. If you have not, you can change your phrasing a little bit. Then, there is a slightly more technical point, a repetition counter. Now, the thing about academic prose is that academic prose has something called the word count. And when I tell you that a PhD thesis is usually written in 80,000 words, your first response will be, wow, that's so much. I can guarantee you, anybody who writes a PhD, for them 80,000 words is nothing. They always want more. I want 90,000, I want 120,000. Because when you start writing on one particular topic, there's always so much more to say. There's secondary literature to cite, there's some other argument you need to develop, there's something more you need to say in the footnote. So what you have to make sure is that you have this conceptual economy when you write. You have to say something as precisely and as concisely as possible. This is just another way of saying when you write something in 80,000 words, you are saying one thing 80,000 times. You're not saying three things. If you try to say that, you will end up writing three books or even an encyclopedia. Because you're writing one dissertation, it has one conceptual spine, it has one argument, and that means that you have to minimize repetition. How do I know when is something being repeated too many times? Well, I can't give you a quantitative answer to that, but let's say if you are repeating the same point in the same paragraph, in my estimate, that is too much repetition. If you're repeating something in the same chapter, maybe that is okay, because sometimes you need to repeat a certain point to tell the reader, look, this is very important. And of course, if you repeat a certain point across chapters, that's actually very good, because what you have to keep in mind is that you have been writing something for, what, three weeks, three years, but I, as your reader, I'm going to read it for the first time. So for me, this is totally new. So you have to kind of persuade me that, okay, this is an argument, you have to help me. You have to write in a way that is reader-friendly. You have to be friendly to me. You cannot expect the whole world to understand you and say, you know, whatever I say is so deeply profound that no way I'm going to get it. If you start writing something with an attitude, with a mentality, your writing style will already become very dense and obscure and nobody will understand you. So repetition counter, you have to minimize repetition, but I won't give you a quantitative answer to that question if you ask me, okay, how do I know if this is getting repetitive? 
And finally, one final point, uh, technical matter, sorry, technical meter. Uh, this is partly because the students are supervised. They come from a range of disciplines. Some of them are more sociologically inclined. Most of my students have a background in philosophy. Some of them are more historically inclined. Now, as you are, as you know, I'm sure, different disciplines, they use the words in a certain technical matter. The kind of English we speak when we are having tea or coffee is not always the English we use when we write an academic article. Say the word historicize or the word idealism, and I can get, go on and on with all kinds of words like that, have very precisely defined meanings. So when you use a word, you have to check whether am I using it in the way that I would use it when I talk to my friend on the phone, or am I using it with that in that very technical sense. And if you keep on shifting between these two senses, one a more colloquial sense, one a more everyday sense, and one a more technical sense, that can crucially impact the argument. Say, just to give you the example which you see there, idealism. Uh, in non-philosophical English, we use the word idealism to mean, oh, you are such an idealist. And by that I mean you are totally out of touch with the real world. Your head is up in the clouds. But the way in which philosophers use the word idealism and idealism very, very different. So if you're writing a piece, and you know this piece is going to be read by a peer reviewer who may happen to be a philosopher, you better check that the word idealism is being used in that way. And that applies if you are a political theorist, if you're an economist, if you're a historian, if you're a sociologist. Now, the um, sum and substance of all of that, to, to go back to the image which I started with, is that academic writing is painstaking, laborious, but it is it can become the labor of love. Right? If you truly are inspired and love producing this form of beautiful tapestries, then no matter how laborious it is, you don't even realize this is hard work. And if you think about the different kinds of things that you really, really enjoy doing, so if I ask you, what is your greatest passion in life? Let's say one of you says, my greatest, truest passion is producing paintings. I, I do art, as we say. And then this is what your friend does, your friend notices that you have spent for the last, say, 10 days, you have spent about 14 hours every day painting. And your friend is amazed. Your friend says, how do you put in so much hard work? But for the person who does this, this is not hard work. It is as intuitive as breathing, right? And that's what I mean by the labor of love, that if writing, thinking, rewriting, rethinking, this whole process can somehow become the labor of love. I will give you the, the formula for doing this. I don't know, I don't think there is. But somehow, if it can tick, if you, whatever you do, you are doing it for the sake of love, let's say. And, and by love here, I mean the, this particular vision I'm showing you of a beautiful tapestry. Even if you spend 15 hours a day writing your thesis, writing your dissertation, your mother may be amazed. You are such a hardworking person, but you don't know what that means. What do you mean? Do you work hard when you breathe? No. Nobody would think of saying, okay, I have been working so hard today because I've been breathing. Why? Because it's so natural to you, it's so spontaneous to you. Likewise, if this kind of a picture captures you, it seizes you, and this is the vision towards which you are working in writing anything, then this is what it will become, right? It will become part of the fabric of your being. So that is the note on which I will end. And now what is going to happen is that, as I say, you can ask me any questions you have about what I've said. Uh, more generally about career prospects, more generally about applying to different universities, including in the UK or even in India. Um, so I, I don't know what's the way to go about this. Shall I just invite people to speak? The session has uh, come to the next phase, that is interaction. So, uh, dear students, basically you have been informed about uh, writing academic paper, and uh, mm, all of you are here. I think major students, honor students. So uh, all of you will be pursuing your masters and uh, time will come when you will be needing this advice so that you can excel in your academic career. So now uh, let us uh, open this for open discussion and the students you may ask on areas like uh, writing papers, how to write, how to publish, as well as uh, about careers in the Western universities, um, how to get into that. So, uh, any query from students is welcome here. She has a question. Please. Uh, 
Tell your name, then us. So that, that is a very important question. Yes, yes. So the, what she wants to know is the, what are the opportunities or avenues available for funding. Right? Now, um, to start on a slightly negative note, the US, although the US is much further away from us than the UK, is slightly better in this respect. So um, I can't remember exactly when. I think it's possibly after your three-year uh, three program, which I think this is the four-year program. So, um, after the three or four year program, if you write an exam called the GRE, Graduate Record Examination, and if you get a good score, in the US, what happens is that teachers have uh, something called a TA, Teaching Assistant Mission. And you are employed partly by this particular university as a TA, and that takes care of your scholarship, your funding. Now, this does not mean that there are no funding opportunities in the UK, but there are much, much more and this is simply because you know, the UK at the end of the day is an island. It's just that. Whereas the US is a continent, it looks like a country, and there's much, much more money in the US than in the UK. Having said that, I mean, there are still um, some, some opportunities, and you can look on Google. Say there's something called the Gates Cambridge Trust in Oxford, there are some other, uh, some other of these trusts. I think it's generally called the Cambridge Commonwealth Trust Scholarship, and some version of that in Oxford. Right? So, Nowadays, what has happened is that, as I was telling someone else last week, that in one sense, you don't really need someone like me to come and tell you this. Because there's some force which is much higher than I am, and that is Google. You don't know. And so, I mean, so when people write to me about funding opportunities, when I'm sitting in Cambridge, and this email comes to me from Kolkata, whom do I go to? I don't go to the university, I go to Google. Sitting in Cambridge, I check on Google, okay, is that right or wrong? And I check with what the person has said to me from Kolkata. So, Google has democratized information. So there's one good thing, let's say, about social media, as we call it, that you don't have to actually travel to London or Sydney, sit somewhere in Boston or, or in Geneva. If you have access to a good internet connection, just look for uh, search keywords, as they're called, something like, uh, I don't know what you look for, like funding opportunities in the UK, or scholarship opportunities in the UK, US. So, so that is my answer, which is not very concrete, because the, the, the concrete details you will find from Google, but that is how to go about doing it. So, next question. Well, English department, no question. Free to ask, uh, don't hesitate. Yeah, see, I, I mean, as I said in the beginning, I mean, it's not even a lecture, it's, it's more of a discussion group, you know. English, English. <coughs> Hello, sir. Yes, I'm Sir Hazari from the uh, Department of English, and I'm currently pursuing my BA, and I'm in the final year. Yeah. Sir, my question is. It's really kind of basic, but I want to know uh, it's which is more wider, the linguistics or the literature? Uh, can, can, can you just explain what you mean by that question? Sorry, sir? Can you just explain what you mean by that question, which is wider, linguistics or literature? Are you asking for the scope or...? No, sir, in, in general field. Uh, and, and by linguistics and literature, you are talking about the, the departments or yeah, the study? from, from uh, English, from, from English literature or... English linguistics. Okay. Uh, well, you say it's an interesting question, and I can't say I have a direct answer to that. Um, possibly, this is my guess, this is my informed guess, they say, this is my educated guess. Uh, possibly the scope, as, as my colleague here pointed out, the scope of a degree in English literature will be higher than the scope of a degree in linguistics. Because 
linguistics tends to be very a very uh, specialized study when you study language, the structure of language, pronunciation, all of that. With a degree in English literature, you can branch out. You can branch out into literature and ecology, religion, uh, literature and religion, literature and theory, literature and postcolonial studies. So uh, that would be my guess. But but in, as, as I'm sure you know, that the linguistics is, the linguistics is included as a particular paper or a topic in many of these faculties of English literature also. So you don't really have to choose between studying literature and linguistics if you find the right faculty. Questions? Do you have a question? Economics, history. Well, that's what I was talking about for 20 minutes, was I not? <laughs> but no, but, but, no, sit down, sit down. So, um, your question is how to develop writing skills in literature. So, what I will do now is because in one sense I've already answered the question. I will answer your question in a slightly different way. So, let me say, let me reflect autobiographically on, on how I got into this business. So, let's say when I was in junior school and high school, I did not think, okay, this is what I'm going to do one day. I'll become a scholar and an academic studying Hinduism and Buddhism. I simply read books. Right? Reading and reading and reading. O of course, one reason why I read books is because I had to take the exams in school. Now, if you want to write, I think what you need to do, you need to set up this spiral, this feedback loop between reading lots and writing lots. Right? So if you just keep on reading and reading and reading, often what happens is that reading becomes a very passive activity. Just reading, but you are really assimilating on them. So you have to read in a very active way, where you are reading, and even as you are reading, you are absorbing the material and putting it in certain, say, I don't want to say boxes, but in certain categories. Right? You are actively reading, not just passively reading. And how do you do that? Uh, the way I did it is I would always take notes. Whenever I would read something, I would write down at least five sentences on that article or on that book. Now, you may be shocked to hear this. I have on my laptop a Word document which runs into about 750,000 words. And do you know what those 750,000 words are? Just the notes I have compiled on everything I have read over the last 28 years. So whenever I write something, read something, I write, I write it out with my thoughts my ideas, my responses, my commentary on that article, on that book, and sometimes I just add long quotation. That's how, that's how this has become 750,000 words. All of those words are not just mine. I just copy and paste. But what that means is that I leave behind, let's say, a paper tray. Right? Every book I've read in the last 20 years has a mark, has a record in that massive file. Now, how that helps me is, because on the Word document, you have a, uh, this option called search. So one day a student of mine says, I want to work on this topic. So the first thing I do, I don't go to the library. I go to a word search. I say, okay, does this topic turn out in my file, in my repository? And if it does, I have a bibliographical citation. Okay, go and read the word word and write the written article. Now, does it help your answer? Does it help to answer your question? I mean, not, not directly, because I, I think I strayed away slightly from your question. Um, so how, how to write is, uh, again, the the somewhat formulaic answer is try to set up this feedback between reading lots and writing lo lots concurrently. So that if you only read but not write, this will, as I say, become a passive activity. I mean, uh, for a more concrete answer, I should have to sit down with you and, and see what you're writing. But, but so my, my answer to your question is that they say 20,000 feet, not, not the ground zero. Because it will depend on what you're actually writing, right? And whether you're writing
writing on Shakespeare or Milton or whoever is a thinker. Depending on the matter, the content, my answer would be somewhat different. But the answer I've given you should apply to pretty much anybody who writes anything. There's form and matter, the conjunction. I hope uh, you've got your answer. Uh, well, any more questions? See, our response person, sir, is not just uh, someone who delivers lecture in the university. In fact, uh, yesterday when I was going through um, his biography, I came across numbers of books that he authored. And that is not only one, uh, through only one particular philosophy, but through diverse philosophies. Uh, he is very familiar with uh, uh, Hindu philosophy, Christian philosophy, Buddhism, and even uh, Western, all the philosophies that you come across. So if you have any question on this also, you may ask, because he's a uh, author. Okay. Uh, uh, a boy raised his hand for a question from that corner. So you can... Well, this is not really a question, but uh, some issue, not really an issue also, but we were uh, facing some, like, panicking and having some anxieties about dissertation. Yeah. You know? So, this, like, this event has kind of opened our eyes. And, like, we were panicking, like, how are we going to write so long passage in our dissertations, you know? And, as you have said, like, small is a beautiful book. No, no, I agree, yes, yes. I, I mean, uh, part of the reason why I highlighted this point, it's not just that I find other people having this problem or anxiety. I myself often find, feel overwhelmed. <coughs> How am I going to write 10,000 words or 80,000 words or 25,000 words? That's why I say small is beautiful. Right? Start with five sentences. And if I tell you, start with five sentences, you may think I'm downgrading. You may think, oh, I am a B student, an MA student. What about five sentences? But try doing that. Try once you realize how difficult it is to write five sentences. Only then you will start writing. Yeah, that's what we were wondering. Like, how are we actually going to do this? And how are we going to do it? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, well, I, I don't have any straightforward answer to the how. Because if I had, I would paint it and become a millionaire by now. On, on YouTube, I say, okay, this is how you do it. There are five boxes to take. A, B, C, D, E, right? So, that's why I said in the beginning that what I'm showing you here is a certain vision, right? I'm not giving you concrete answers. That regarding this question, this is how it should be answered. The concrete details of the how, you will have to work it out in uh, consultation and discussion with your supervisor, with your friends. Uh, there are various ways to do this. Hey, just like we said, uh, there is no straightforward yeah. Yeah. thing. Yeah, if there was it, like every one of us would have finished the presentation. Exactly, yeah. yes. And I would have become a millionaire. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big, big, because I would not come here unless you pay me 45 likes or something. And I'd say, okay, here is the answer, which I patented regarding the how. And I'm going to spell it out in 35 minutes. And this is my fee. Right? But I'm not charging you a fee, am I? Because I don't have an answer to the how. What I'm, what I'm giving you is like, how you may begin to go there. And again, this is something I've realized only in recent years, that this is how I arrived. So when I was 18 years old, nobody gave me this saying, if you do this, you will get there. This is me retrospectively retracing my steps. Thinking, okay, now that I'm here, what was I doing 20 years ago, which brought me here? So that's what you see there on your slides. And so uh, that's all I have to say regarding the how. Uh, quick answer is I don't know. But, 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 um, but hopefully we will get there if you keep on trying. So yeah, with me and our friends, so now, to, now due to this event, we have just like opened our eyes and have more vast views on how to proceed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I hope you got your answer. So we expect our more questions if you have. Uh, 
maybe I do not explain that point clearly enough. So the reason why I landed the criteria is because um, the faculty, I think uh, this is a good opportunity for me to tell you what that word means. Given it, so you see there my uh, designation. Uh, I teach in that faculty called Faculty of DVDT. Now what does that mean? Uh, uh, divinity is just an old-fashioned word for the study of religion from different perspectives. So philosophical, <coughs> theological, historical, sociological, uh, what, what is this? Uh, I'm sure there are more perspectives. Uh, so, so if you want to study the category of religion as a social force, as a human phenomenon, religion in its intersection with society, with humanity, all of that is, en uh, is encompassed by the term divinity. Now what that means is that my students they come from a wide range of uh, disciplinary perspectives. So some of them are more interested in the sociology of religion, how religion is a social force. Some of them are more interested in philosophical debates about does God exist or not, what is the concept of God. Some of them are more interested in the history of religion. What was it that was generating, animating some people to build norms like this? Right? So religion as a human uh, force. Now, Partly because of that, partly because of this wide spectrum, this range, when I read some of the work of my students, I myself don't quite know whether a particular word is being used in a technical sense, or this is just the way we would use it outside academic rules. And I give you the example of idealism, which is a philosophical term, if you write philosophical English, but it can also be a term we use in, we use in everyday English. And since you are in English literature, I'm sure we can think of some technical word in English literature which is used only by academics. Can you think of one? Uh, people who do something called postcolonial theory, they, they often use words in that way, say hybridity. There's a word called hybridity or alterity. And, and these words, they have meanings in an English dictionary, but the meaning given to these words in an English dictionary may not coincide with the way it is used by these academics. So, when you are writing a paper and sending it to a certain journal, your peer reviewers may be more accustomed with the technical meaning than the general meaning. And they may say, you, you are not using it in the proper way. So that's what I mean by technical meter. Is that what I said? Yeah, technical meter. That, that check whether a word is being used by you in a technical sense or a non-technical sense. I mean, usually we, we don't have this problem. I mean, if we are not academic, right? I mean, say, if we are not academic, we are, I don't know what we are. Let's say, we just journalists or somebody, some other kind of profession, we use words in only one register. Say, when you speak to your mother at home, you don't speak to her in one way in the morning and another way in the evening. You just use the same language, whether it's Bengali or Bengali or Hindi or essence. But here you have to learn to skillfully go back and forth between a more technical kind of English, which has been configured for writing ethical <coughs> prose, and a non-technical kind of English we use elsewhere. So that was the point I was trying to capture with that phrase, technical meter. Okay.
Arjuna did not become enslaved to Krishna. In fact, Krishna liberated Arjuna by making him his quote unquote slave. Yeah, so, so that's one answer to this. Uh, I mean, that, that still doesn't answer the question whether did Arjuna feel free? I mean, phenomenologically, inside we always feel free. Like, say, if you are going to buy a new car, you may feel very free to buy this. Right? But, but I may know top down there are all kinds of causal mechanisms operating on you because you saw that. Or maybe your uncle say, unless you buy me the car, or else, right? So uh, we are not always able to trace all these different causes and trajectories which are impinging on us. I, I think uh, it's already 1.30, uh, and we have uh, to keep at least a 30 minutes gap for the next session. So uh, we, we think it's time that we wind up. And so thank you, uh, dear students, for your questions. And uh, you know, of course, we all are grateful, thankful to our precious person for your love. OK, this will be the last question, OK? <coughs> something philosophically is always superior than approaching it logically. Mm, okay. Um, why do you say, why do you put the contrast between philosophically and logically? Because somebody would say that logic is just a subset of philosophy. Maybe what you want to say is something like this. In writing something, should I approach it logically or should I approach it poetically? Right? I mean, that, that seems to me to be a more useful contrast between poetically and because as you know, I mean, people who are very logical, they are very logical, but they have a reputation of being very dry. Right? And people who are very poetical, they are very poetical, but often you don't understand what they say. So if we can be both poetic and logical somehow, I mean, you can write, you can express in a poetic manner your logical thoughts. And what do I mean by that? Here, here's one very concrete example. Um, unless, I mean, before you study something called logic or philosophy, you may not realize, I mean, even I didn't realize this, that almost all our waking life is shaped by a certain argument called modus ponens. And this is what modus ponens looks like. If A is true, then B is true. A is indeed true, then therefore B is true. Now, now this pattern of argumentation has this technical name called modus ponens. Now, if this is the first time you're hearing about modus ponens, you may say, okay, do I actually use it all the time? You think about it, you do use it all the time. So here's one example. If I think this lecture is interesting, I keep on sitting here. I think this lecture is interesting, therefore I keep on sitting here. So we have been using modus ponens for about one hour now, don't we? And this is just one example. In many different ways in your life, we use modus ponens. So this is a logical pattern of inference. Now this, again, is just a form, it's not a matter. The matter you can express with beautiful poetic symbolism, imagery, metaphors, and that's why even uh, three or four different philosophers, when the argument they are trying to make is logically equivalent, their writing styles are very different, aren't they? Right? Somebody may use more concrete examples from everyday life, somebody's writing style could be more dry and abstract. Uh, so that is really up to you. So I would not say there's any fundamental opposition between feeling poetically and thinking logically. In principle, it can be done. Thank you. Now, uh, we have come towards the end of the program. So, I request 
Mrs. Banerjee who had was to come for the dais to deliver a word of thanks on behalf of Kolkata Government College Speciality. Thank you. Mr. Fifi Marzali, sir. Respected Mrs. Person and the Dias, Honorable Professor Sankamita Sodhuri, Madam, Dr. Hema Professor Kya, Madam, Learned Faculty Members, my dear student friends. It is my privilege to offer a photo of thanks on behalf of Pukaza Gopkola's fraternity. I would like to start with offering a photo of thanks to Dr. Omkur Borua, Senior University Lecturer, Department of uh, Divinity, Faculty of Divinity of Cambridge University. Thank you, sir. Despite having your busy schedule, you are here amongst us today. You have presented a wonderful deliberation. I hope our students have immensely benefited by your lecture. Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to request you all to give a big round of applause to our honorable Mrs. Professor, since this is made a visit to Kukrajar Gopalas. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to offer my sincere thanks and gratefulness to Professor Sankhamita Sudhari, Madam, Head of the Department of Political Science, Borland University, for her untiring effort to make this program a grand success. As our Honorable Principal Madam has told, that she has been the key, uh, she has been the key to this program as she established that linkage between our Honorable Mrs. Person Sir and the Kukrajar Bhopalas fraternity. Thank you, Madam. Next, I'd like to offer my sincere thanks and gratefulness to our Honorable Principal of Kukrajar Government College, Dr. Bonovina Bromo, Madam. Unless and until she inspired SARS, after as a SARS, probably this would not have been a reality. So thank you, Madam. Last but not the least, I would like to offer my sincere thanks and gratefulness to all the faculty members, to all the technical members, and to all my dear student friends. Unless and until you cooperate, perhaps this program would not have been into a, a reality. So with this, thanking you all, thank you very much. Thank you, Monastery, uh, for wonderful deliveries of a uh, word of thanks. Now, finally, we have come towards the end, so this is the end of the program. Thank you. Thank you.